Okay, hi everyone. Delighted to be here. My first time in Sweden, actually. Um, I thought Australians were the only ones who used the word bloody, actually. I was surprised. I you, you, well, I'm going to have to go with crikey today. Okay, so as Tina said, I wrote this book, uh, Disrupt, and the, re the reason I wrote it, really, well, there was, there was three reasons. It all has to do with ideas, though. I worked with a company called Frog Design, which is a global innovation firm for about eight years as a creative director, working on every industry imaginable um, across the world. And there was one phrase that I kept hearing all the time when we were working on innovation strategies, and that is, Luke, we do not need any more ideas. We have more ideas than we know what to do with. Right? And I think this came from this absolute fatigue with brainstorming. You know, companies have been told that they have to innovate for the last decade, right? This has been the big thing. As a result, they've got ideas everywhere, right? But they're disillusioned. They don't... One of the executives I work with, Beth Comstock at GE, calls this paralysed by possibility, right? There seems to be so many directions, I don't know where to go. But when I ask to see those ideas, a funny thing happens. They start backpedalling. Right? They say, well, we don't have them written down or anything, right? but we discuss them a lot. And this is one of the problems. Ideas rarely make it, they're nothing more than water cooler conversations. And they remain there, stuck sort of half-baked in people's heads. And they just keep talking about them and actually not doing anything about it. And as a result, they sort of remain abstract and nobody can share them or do anything with them. Now, the second problem is that these ideas, as Tina alluded to, are generally incremental ideas. So they're ideas that support existing products and services. They're ideas that support their existing business model. And Tina said before that makes us fat and lazy, and I believe this. This is my representative fat and lazy guy. I'm not sure who he is, but he's the happiest guy I could find on the internet. Now, the reason being, the ideas that we like the most are the ones that we're most familiar with because they're the most intuitive. They're the products and services that we've interacted with the most. Therefore, they're the ones that seem intuitively right. And this is why companies, their portfolios are full of these incremental ideas because they're the ones the executive team feels are intuitively right. This is a problem. It's a big problem. Because if you get on an incremental change path, that path gets narrower and narrower. And at some stage, you are going to end, reach the end of that path. And by the time you do, generally, your customers have forsaken you for another offering that nobody saw coming. And this is this cycle of disruption that we see happening again and again. Right? Blockbuster was the disruptor, and then they become disrupted by Netflix. Motorola was a disruptor in their industry and then they were disrupted by Nokia and now Nokia is the disruptee. Okay, we see this again and again because of this incremental path people get on. If they do take disruptive risks with their ideas and their portfolio of strategy options, it's because normally they're backed into a corner and they have no other choice. But by then it's too late to change. And this is exactly what Clayton Christensen, right, the professor at Harvard University wrote about in The Innovator's Dilemma, when he described disruptive technology and this cycle that keeps happening again and again. Okay, successful companies, they ignore the new technologies and the new products because they don't support their existing business models and the market's not big enough. And they don't react fast enough. But as a result, I think the flip side of this and everyone talking about disruption is often they use te technology and disruption in the same sentence. And I think disruptive innovation for many people has become more about how to spot and react to new technologies and new products coming up. Okay, because that's where we started with this. So, okay, we've got to be aware, we've got to spot and react. What I'm here to talk about today and why I wrote the book was I think there's something much more important that we have to embrace and do, and that is how to learn how to be that disruptive change in the industry, which I think is a lot harder than just spotting and reacting. And when you want to be the disruptive change in an industry, 
you know, it's no longer comfortable, it's no longer intuitive, it's no longer safe. So you no longer have sort of happy Santa Claus here. If you really want to embrace disruptive thinking, disruptive change, the process, the way you feel through the process, looks more like this. Now, does anyone recognise this image? Psycho, right, exactly. What was this scene? The shower scene, right. I've never seen anyone do this without doing ee, ee, ee. It's like an automatic response. Now, can anyone tell me what happened in that film before the shower scene, before she was killed in the shower scene? Where did the film start? Well done. I never get that answer. <laughs> if, oh, no. If I had some stickers with me, you would be getting a sticker right now. That's exactly it. She stole a suitcase of money, right? The suitcase was in the back of the car. They were driving along the road. started raining. She got tired, pulled over into this hotel, okay, taking a nice relaxing shower to unwind, and then ee, 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 right? Now, the curious part about that is it caught the audience by surprise. Who was that? Why did they kill her? They didn't even know about the suitcase in the car. Okay, and this is what in Hollywood terms is called a turning point. Catches the audience by surprise and completely sparks their curiosity about where this film is going. And it changes the trajectory of the film. So it's no longer a caper film, which is where it started. You know, the caper genre. It's gone somewhere else. Now, turning points don't just exist in movies. They exist in business. And the job of anyone who's interested in disruptive thinking is really about finding or developing the ability to find these turning points, find and develop these turning points in your segment, your category, or your industry. How are you going to find the turning point that'll take your segment, category, and industry in a new direction? And that's what it's all about. And it's terrifying because you do not know where it's going. You don't know the easy answers. Now, one of my favorite examples of how to start this process is from Steve Jobs. And obviously, we've all heard the, you know, the news that Steve Jobs is retiring. And so I thought I'd share this, this anecdote from Frog's history. Frog design was have been around 40 years. And very early on, they started working with Steve Jobs. They had a long history of working with Apple. Now, one of the first projects they kicked off was a project called Snow White. You can see Steve's signature here. This is 1982. I love these old documents, actually. I mean, they were literally running around photocopying Disney books and <laughs> getting the brief together. But it was called Snow White because it was meant to be an exploration of seven products that would define the future of Apple. So Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Now, whenever you're working on a project for something, as a consultant, you're always responding to a brief. And I'm sure you've all written briefs. I'm sure you've all responded to briefs. Normally, they're pages and pages of requirements, particularly if you're talking about a technology product. It has to be this price point. It has to be aimed at this target segment. It has to be have this much memory. It has to be this speed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Pages and pages of requirements. Now, all Steve Jobs said, I'll tell you the brief that he gave Frog Design that led to the development of the first Apple Macintosh um, SE. So it was a very influential project. He didn't give us lists and lists of requirements. He was in the room with a founder, Hartman Esslinger, and he simply said this, I want Bob Dylan songs. I mean, what on earth are you meant to do with that? <laughs> you know, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Instead of receiving a PDF brief in the, in the email, you get an MP3. Come gather you know. around people. This is what I want. I threw that in just in case nobody knows Bob Dylan. <laughs> and I love this story because I can just imagine the scene knowing the founder. You know, he'd be, he'd be in the room with Steve and, and Steve would be going, I, could, I want Bob Dylan songs. And he's going, okay. Um, but Steve, do you have any idea of, you know, the, the, who it's for, the market? And Steve would just be going. Come gather around people wherever just you roam. And this is what we call 
and in a disruptive hypothesis. This is an intentionally unreasonable statement that gets your flowing, your thinking flowing in another direction, right? It smashes the way you normally think about something, changes the pattern. And Steve Jobs is a master provocator. He's a walking provocation. Anyone who, who uh, any of the designers you speak to at Apple will tell you this. Continual provocation. And this is the real difference between disruptive thinking or disruptive innovation and just normal innovation. It's a difference between prediction and provocation. There's far too much prediction happening in companies at the moment. This is the way we're trained. We predict what the sales are going to be, what the next product should be, etc. Far too little provocation. Now, examples of this abound everywhere. And one of the things I talk about in the process is surfacing the cliches, what everyone takes for granted, like in television, for instance. There was this rule all the time. It was called the hugging and learning rule. So the children would go off and get into trouble, come back, family, there'd be tension, and they'd resolve it by the end of the episode. You've seen this on the Cosby show and everything else. Somebody came along and said, I'm sick of this hugging and learning rule. New rule, no hugging and learning. No matter how much trouble the characters get into, they will not develop. <laughs> okay, that was Larry David of Seinfeld. Okay, soda. We take for granted the cliché, soda is inexpensive, tastes great because of all the sugar, and it's marketed as aspirational. Okay? This isn't soda, this is American democracy in a can. Okay, somebody came up with a hypothesis and said, what if soda was expensive, tasted bad, and we stopped making pe telling people it's going to change their life, and we advertise it as functional. So it gives you a boost when you need it, and that was Red Bull. Rental cars. Okay, some of the prevailing cliches were you had to see the customer, fill out paperwork, they rent cars by the day. Somebody came along with a disruptive hypothesis, really overturned those and said, what if we didn't have to see the customer, skip the paperwork and we rent cars by the hour. And this was Zipcar in the United States. We took the car sharing model from Europe and gave it their own spin. And my favourite example is socks. I mean, how long have we been wearing socks that match and buying them in pairs? Until somebody came along and said, what if we sold socks in sets of three and none of them match? <laughs> right? What a crazy thing is that to say? But what they found, they found in a company called Little Mismatch, and they found out that eight to 12-year-old girls love wearing socks that don't match. Now they're into toys, they're into furniture and all sorts of other things. Now the key with this is, and what I want to leave you with as we lead into Naveen is, what was the problem that they solved? There was no problem. It's not a problem to buy socks in pairs that match. <laughs> so it's far more effective with disruptive thinking and innovation to start with something that is not broken. Okay? These are the things that nobody else is looking at because they're not screaming for attention the way problems are. And there's so many of these. They're everywhere. And there's a whole process for getting through this, but I'll let you read the book for that. But what I want to leave you is, is the potential for reinvention is all around us. There has never been a better time to make an impact on the world. And I think it's an amazing time to be thinking about how to structure or restructure your business, your community, even your life in new ways that create value. So please, really enjoy these possibilities. There's never been many, um, any more of them. Thank you. Thank you.